And this is Andrew Kite, the Executive Director of the Family Business Center here at Loyola, welcoming you for our webinar on managing uh, addiction in the workplace. Uh, we are delighted to have our guest speaker, David Cohen. Uh, David is a licensed clinical social worker and uh, has certification in uh, addictions counseling as well and has been treating people with chemical dependency and mental illness since, since 2001. He's worked as a chemical dependency counselor with Hazelden in Chicago since 2006 and he's an adjunct professor here at Loyola uh, training master's level social workers in addiction treatment. Uh, he's got an extensive track record in helping people engage in the process of a lifelong recovery from addiction. Um, before I uh, hand it over to David, I want to make a few quick announcements. Um, number one, I'd like you to just be aware of your dialogue screen in the, in the upper right-hand corner of your, your screen. There's a little box that says chat. We welcome any questions that you have because the more we can uh, make this webinar address the questions that you have and how uh, what your concerns are about addictions in, in the context of your family uh, business, whether it's within your family or whether in it, it's within your business, um, the more powerful this webinar will be. So please uh, share any questions that you might have through the dialog box. Um, all uh, questions are confidential. We won't uh, be talking about who asked the question or anything like that. It will be kept completely confidential and we'll hand those questions off to David to respond to uh, when we do that. Um, also, you may notice that we're going to have a couple more transitions than we normally have because uh, we're incorporating a video in today's presentation. Uh, so those transitions may take a few seconds. Uh, just wanted to kind of make you aware of that. <clears throat> Finally, I want to make sure that any of you who haven't signed up for uh, our program on September 20th, which will feature Frank Abagnale from Catch Me If You Can, if you know that movie. Uh, that movie was based on his life. He's going to be talking about managing uh, security in your family and uh, managing your privacy in this really uh, global uh, online world that we live in these days. So it's going to be a great program. It's going to be out at O'Hare on September 20th. Uh, if you'd like to register, you can just send us a, an email in your chat box and we'll make sure you get registered for the uh, program on September 20th. With that, I will hand it over to our guest speaker, David Cohen, as I said, an expert with uh, chemical dependency uh, and mental illness and an adjunct professor here at Loyola. So David, thank you. thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, this is an honor and a privilege to be uh, asked to speak uh, on behalf of Loyola, and uh, I welcome all the visitors today. Uh, our topic today is addiction, and while I know that addiction carries with it a large stigma, I ask that you suspend your current perception and definition of addiction and uh, let yourself go with it. Hopefully you will learn new definitions, new ways to speak to your family about addiction and resources available to you. Uh, I know uh, firsthand that this is a difficult topic to talk about. Uh, those that don't know a lot about it uh, have their perceptions based from the media. Those that do know a lot about it uh, potentially are feeling the pain from it as we speak. So I ask that as we go along, if you have specific examples or specific questions that uh, are specific to you and your place of employment or your families, uh, consider asking. I realize that uh, this is kind of a maybe an indirect method, but uh, if I can help you today, I'd be more than happy to. Our topics are going to include an overview of addiction, the impact of addiction on the workplace, and options for employers. As Andrew mentioned, there will be a video clip that explains the impact of addiction on the brain. So first, we'll start off with an overview of addiction.
nearly two-thirds of Americans drink alcohol and have drank alcohol at some point in their lives. At least 110 million people admitted to having one drink in the past month. Drug and alcohol problems come in many shapes and sizes, and therefore there's no cookie-cutter explanation for the onset of substance abuse or how to address these problems. Almost 14 million Americans have problems with drinking. 8 million have diagnosable alcoholism, while 6 million have what would be classified as alcohol abuse. Most of the 14 million are between the ages of 18 and 49 and are employed full time. It's estimated that 10 percent of Americans' workforce have problems with alcohol. Why is this relevant to private businesses? Well, for one, the cost of alcohol and the consequences associated with it drive up health care costs to the workers and their families. Specific illicit drugs that we may be talking about through today's presentation include marijuana, cocaine, and painkillers. Looking at this chart, of the 7 million people classified with dependence or abuse, 4.2 million were dependent on marijuana, representing 1.7% of the population. 1.7 million people were dependent or abused cocaine, and 1.6 million people are currently abusing painkillers. So you can see that marijuana is currently the most widely used illicit drug among our workforce today. Cocaine and painkillers, while taking a second and third place, are probably about half or even less than those that smoke marijuana. Substance abuse and addiction compromises the productivity of any workforce and increases the cost of doing business. Substance abuse is associated with lower productivity, increased turnover, workplace accidents, and higher health insurance costs. Just to give you the backdrop of the cost of addiction on our government, the federal government spent $238 billion on substance abuse and addiction, or 10% of the federal budget. If substance abuse and addiction were its own budget category, it would rank sixth in size behind Social Security, National Defense, Income Security, Medicare, and other health programs. So that's just to show you the magnitude of the impact of unaddressed substance abuse in our nation. State governments, including the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, spent 15% of their budgets, roughly $135 billion, to deal with substance abuse and addiction, uh, which is up from 13% in 1998. Again, if substance abuse and addiction were its own budget category, it would rank second behind education. States spend more on substance abuse and addiction than they spend on Medicaid, higher education, transportation, or justice. Local governments spent conservatively $93.8 billion on substance abuse and addiction, or 9% of its local budgets. So what is addiction? ASAM is a, an organization uh, that I'd like for you to be familiar with. Uh, and this is a good resource that can be available to you should you want to look into it further. I'm going to click on it briefly, which will take us to a web page. The ASAM is the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And on it, you will find the definition of addiction in its long form. I recommend that anybody from Human Resources or those of you that have policy around addiction and alcohol use uh, maybe incorporate this particular document in your policy manual. Um, the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which, is, which was written in 1939 by Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, had Dr. William Silkworth write his take on what he believed to be the true nature of alcohol and alcoholism. 
he described alcoholism as being an obsession of the mind and an allergy of the body, that while the alcoholic was not continually drinking, that during the time that he was not drinking, he was often preoccupied with the thinking of getting, using, and finding ways and means to drink. That the alcoholic was so uncomfortable in his own skin that he couldn't feel comfortable unless he were to consume alcohol. That the obsession was overpowering, that that obsession was greater than work productivity, family members, spouse, even kids. So that when the alcoholic does drink, there's then an allergy. So it's not unlike any food allergy that when the alcoholic ingests alcohol, there's an allergic reaction. Uh, there's a joke going around the rooms of AA that that when people drink or drug that have the allergy that they break out and often they break out in handcuffs. So that uh, while somewhat funny uh, also shares a reflection of a consequence of untreated addiction. So it's an obsession of the mind and a physical allergy. Addiction is primary. It's a chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Dysfunction in these circuits leads to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. This is reflected in an individual pathology pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and other behaviors. The big book also talks about addiction as being cunning, baffling, powerful. Um, as Andrew shared, I've been in the field now for 12 years, uh, and I've, I've pretty much heard every story in the book, and to this day, I continue to be perplexed at some of the lengths families and people go to to protect addiction. To shed some light, I'd like to turn it over and view a clip from Dr. Kevin McCauley who has a really good take on addiction as a brain disease. He has a video called Pleasure Unwoven, uh, and in its entirety is a couple hours. This is a clip from the video that um, illustrates the brain disease. Welcome, Welcome to, to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. The dopamine neurons send their reward processing up. They project from the VTA to the NA, and then... <clears throat> ...to the frontal cortex. Now the frontal cortex becomes involved. It sends glutamate neurons... Back down to the midbrain. As the brain generates an experience of pleasure, the neurons going up release dopamine. And the neurons going down release glutamate. Normally, this up and down communication enables the brain to recognize and learn those things in the environment that are good for survival. Dopamine says, hey, this is important. Glutamate says, okay, I'll remember. Dopamine says, hey, I really want this. Glutamate says, fine, go and get it. That's the way this elegant but delicate system was meant to work. For food, for sex, for Madeline cookies. Drugs go straight to this mechanism and wipe it out. These surges of neurochemicals are like flash floods tearing through the landscape of the brain. Each use of the drug, every flash flood, ravages the brain's delicate physiology sweeping away everything in its path. With time, deep channels are carved into the brain. Drug pathways become stronger and stronger, 
normal pathways become weaker and weaker. Dr. Stephen Hyman of Harvard University calls addiction a pathological overlearning of the drug and all that goes with it. This isn't a normal memory. This is a drug hypermemory, and these memories may be permanent. They leave the addict vulnerable to relapse even after years of abstinence. Welcome to GoToWebinar, Web Events Made Easy. Control, craving, diminished recognition of significant problems with one's behaviors and relationships, and a dysfunctional emotional response. Like other chronic diseases, addiction often involves cycles of relapse and remission. Without treatment or engagement in recovery activities, addiction is progressive and can result in disability or premature death. People with addiction compulsively use even though it may not make them feel good. In some cases, long after the pursuit of rewards is not actually pleasurable. Although people from any culture may choose to get high from one or another activity, it is important to appreciate that addiction is not solely a function of choice. Simply put, addiction is not a desired condition. I believe that this is a good opportunity to take questions on the disease of addiction before we transition into the next segment, which is the impact of addiction on the workplace. Great. Uh, one question that was kind of asked is, um, how, do you, are, how do you identify the, uh, when, when it's a problem and, I mean, it, is it something that develops over time, uh, be getting worse and worse and worse, or is it uh, an event in, in, in terms of how do you know when a, a, a family member is addicted? There are two um, kind of there are two illnesses described in the DSM. One is substance abuse, the other being substance dependence substance dependence being addiction. They both have very different characteristics, but in general, if you or someone that you love continues to use in the face of adverse consequences, that would be an example of abuse. So perhaps you know a loved one that's gotten a DUI and chalked it up to being at the wrong place, wrong time, or Maybe their productivity has gone down and chalked it up to you know various distractions, but you know that it's probably related to their substance use. Um, that often then is a person in denial who has a consequence for their using, but continues to use anyway. This is a, a really good example of just a general abuse category. Now, in terms of Specifically at the workplace, this would be inconsistent time, you know, coming in late, leaving early, um, unaccounted for time, uh, extended lunches, obviously physically, um, maybe tired, run down, bloodshot eyes. Uh, they may have a, a body odor smell from not bathing. They may have bloodshot eyes or uh, they may smell of alcohol and or drugs. Addiction, though, is, is a different animal altogether. It's a primary chronic disease. It's, it's primary meaning that it's not caused by depression. It's not caused by, you know, there are risk factors, but it's not that someone uses drugs in response to an emotional feeling. It's separate from that, that while they may have addic uh, depression and or another mental illness. Addiction is separate from that. They, they use because that part of the brain described in the video, the uh, ventral tegmental area, uh, has been impacted and hijacked. Um, so the addict uh, and how that differentiates from the, the problem user is generally it, there's an organic shift so that the brain then becomes addicted body organs become addicted, and this is manifested through withdrawal and tolerance. 
so that the person inflicted needs more and more to get the same effect. You'll see a diminished uh, capacity in organs, which may result in poor skin color, uh, sport, poor temperature control, depending on what organ has been impacted. Uh, generally, addicts take a serious physical toll as a result of their addiction. And again, it depends on which drug we're, we, we're referring to. But generally speaking, the, the difference between an abuse and a dependent is that there's an internal uh, dependence so that our tissue becomes dependent on it, our brains become dependent on it, and that's when the, the idea of choice then leaves the equation. Um, there's significant more consequences. Many of them are internal. And is that the uh, same you, with behavioral uh, addiction? addictions? Um, is, do the, I mean, the that, that pathways that the video explored, is that the same with uh, a behavioral addiction? In general, uh, all compulsive behaviors um, are a result of that particular part of our brain getting overstimulated, the BTA. It's the part of our brain that's the, the mammalian part of our brain, uh, the first to develop. If you were to stick your finger in your ear as far as it goes, uh, and I wish this wasn't a webinar so that we can have one of our participants maybe try that, uh, but since we can't, just imagine that you are in the very center of your brain. That is the part of the brain that is impacted by addiction, um, all addictions, behavioral or otherwise. Now, as we've developed as humans, so is our brain. And at this point, we have the ability to use choice and to make decisions and to use our memory um, and to kind of rationalize through choice. Uh, but that's the part of the brain that gets hijacked and takes over from the more cognitive, um, newer part of our brain. So while all addictions originate from that particular area, depending on what your drug of choice is or behavioral addiction or compulsion, um, the different parts of the brain then act differently. So that, for example, gambling uh, acts on the neurotransmitter of dopamine. And that's very different than the opiate addict, which um, doesn't really um, hit on a neurotransmitter at all, but rather um, helps to manage pain. So it takes away our natural opiates in our brain, replaces them with the artificial opiate, and therefore, if we do experience pain, um, we will either A, need to use our drug of choice, uh, or B, have to experience the pain because our brain no longer produces um, what's called substance P. So while all addiction originates from the same part of the brain, uh, depending on your drug of choice or behavioral addiction, um, there's other manifestations and chemical imbalances that occur as well. Great. So why don't we uh, move on to the next section? Okay. The impact of addiction on the workplace. As a supervisor, you have an important role in dealing with alcohol and drug problems in the workplace. You have the day-to-day -day responsibility to monitor the work the production, the on-the-job conduct of your employees. It is not your responsibility, however, to diagnose alcohol and drug problems in your employees. You might be first on the scene. You might be the first to, to notice the change in behavior. You are on the front lines, uh, but it is not your job to diagnose. At some point, I'm sure all of you have encountered employees with problems related to drugs and alcohol. Maybe it was dealing with their performance, conduct, leave problems. Sometimes it might have been your own family member. In some cases, you might not know what the problem is. You just see this kind of radical behavior, and you're, you're really not sure what to point it to. In other cases, you may know, either because the employee admits it to you, or it's pretty obvious. Remember that your role is not to diagnose but to exercise responsibility in dealing with the performance or conduct problem. It is your job to hold the employee or family member accountable, 
and refer to the EAP or take appropriate disciplinary action. Make no mistake, a role in dealing with alcohol and drug addiction in the workplace is crucial. You know, often, uh, you know, addiction plays out outside of the workplace after work hours. And work becomes kind of that almost excuse, if you will, for how to hide the addiction from family and friends. It's easy to say, well, you know, I still have my nine to five. You know, I'm not homeless. I'm not jobless. Uh, I'm still the primary supporter of our family. I still have a team of people that work under me. How can I be an addict? Oftentimes, it's those relationships at work that when impacted and when confronted mean the most and can really help break through denial. Uh, I'm also a certified interventionist. And so while most of my work is working with people that have identified that they have a problem and are willing to take action to recover, interventions are very different. Often it's, um, you know, the, the family becomes my client and not the identified patient. And it's my job to elicit the strengths within the family and to create a wall of love and encouragement and a voice that is unified in that we love you, we support you, but, my no, but by no means can this behavior continue. I recently did an intervention on an attorney who belongs to his dad's practice. And this was an example of a guy who was acting completely neurotic, but family members could not put a finger on it. They heard rumors that maybe there was some drug use involved, but they had never seen any specific examples. His supervisor, who was uh, in this particular law firm not in a, a family member, uh, was very responsible for bringing his concern to his parents, his father who owns the, the agency. His father at the time, you know, again, <clears throat> had a blind eye and, you know, just kind of looked at it as, you know, it, it can't be addiction. You know, we're hearing rumors, but blah, blah, blah. He was very good and, you know, his dad's partner and kind of getting dad to see the true gravity of that if this is addiction, this could have extreme implications both personally and professionally. We ultimately had an intervention in which his colleagues, family, friends participated. And I would say overall that it was the impact that his colleagues had, particularly his direct supervisor, that probably had the biggest influence in getting him into treatment. Now while family concerns were extremely important to him as well, it was the fact that his job was not going to be waiting for him unless he got the help that he needed that I think drove him into treatment. Today he is post-treatment, he is back at work, and uh, he's been sober now for about 90 days. Um, I think it was the courage of coworkers and colleagues that came to the table to help this guy that ultimately got him to where he needed to be. Uh, today he abstains from, from all drugs and alcohol. Uh, it turns out that all the rumors that his family discovered were true. He was addicted to crystal meth. So going back to Andrew's question, these are some areas that you may see uh, that impact performance in the workplace. Employees and family members with drug and alcohol problems are not likely to leave those problems behind just because they go to work. These are some examples. Leaving attendance, performance problems, relationships at work, behaviors at work. Now, in the next section, we're going to talk a lot about families. 
And I just want to remind the members of this webinar that, you know, oftentimes the symptoms of addiction on family members is remarkably similar to that of the addict. And again, this example of the, the law firm, how, you know, everyone saw this peculiar behavior, but no one wanted to pinpoint addiction was a cunning example of how the problem can be staring at, at you right in the face and there's just a failure to, to look at it. Denial, while being probably the key feature in addiction, is also the key feature in the family impact of addiction. That it's easy to blame your upbringing and your parenting style and take responsibility. It's much harder to look the truth in the eye. Moving forward, uh, these are some symptoms that are both common with addiction as well as the family impact of addiction. Preoccupation, arguments, stress, defensiveness, mood swings, problems in living, depression, rage, numbness. In the beginning of addiction, the, chemical, the chemically dependent person is in denial. I usually encounter a stronger denial in the family system. They do not see the addictive behavior, nor do they perceive themselves as being affected by the drinking or drug behavior. Families associated associate the disruptive behaviors with alcohol and drugs and become so preoccupied with the chemicals that they disregard the changes in their own thinking and behaviors. Chemical dependency is a family disease and a primary disease within each family member. If you think of the family as an organism, its parts are interdependent. The members operate in a system. They work together for survival. Consider a, a mobile. The beauty of a mobile is its balance, its flexibility. It has a way of responding to changes, circumstances such as wind. Because of the system balance, each member of the family begins to respond to the dependent from a double level position. So if you picture a mobile and you have this perfect balance and you have one part of the mobile kind of off balance using, the rest of the family compensates to find that balance. There are roles within the family. Usually there's the chief enabler, you know, the person that kind of holds the glue together and just gives them permission to continue with their disease without even really knowing it. There's the family hero, the person that comes in and saves the day, the scapegoat where all the blame seems to go, and the mascot. So each family member, you know, whether it's within the system of employment or within the family, in this case both, um, develops these new positions to find homeostasis and balance within the family system. I want to touch on enabling. These are some examples of how a family member may overcompensate and enable an addict to still continue to use. By definition, enabling is the action that protects the individual from the addiction and the consequences of his or her behavior. This would include covering up for the employee, lending the employee or family member money, allow allowing the spouse or friends to call in, shifting the employee's work to other employees, making excuses, adjusting work schedules. Now you may be doing this in hopes that and, 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 and thinking that you're actually helping the family member or employee along, um, but really it hinders, it prevents them from hitting a bottom, seeing consequences and for admitting that they too uh, need to address this problem. Now, you know, once we get into recovery, I think it's uh, important to distinguish that while enabling helps to protect the individual and their disease, oftentimes some of those same behaviors are illustrated in recovery, but there's a big difference between supporting somebody in their addiction and supporting somebody in their recovery. Any questions at this stage of the game? Uh, not at the moment. 
Moving forward, I think a genogram is an excellent tool for looking at the family's role and response to addiction throughout generations. This is a tool that I often utilize in the intervention process. Given that addiction is a family disease, it's important to see the role of addiction throughout generations. Going back to the video, Dr. McCauley theorizes that every addiction's origin is trauma. I try to go back 100 years into a family's history and really look at, well, where was the first trauma? Trauma is anything that's less than nurturing. For many, it's immigration. You know, those that have come over from, you know, Ireland, uh, turn of the century that didn't know the language and had to build a, a community in an area that they knew little about. A lot of these people came over at the turn of the century and they were taught, you know what, we don't talk about our problems. How does that translate once they have kids? If those kids learn that we don't talk about our, our problems, that we just man up, stuff everything, don't talk about anything and persevere, we have nothing to complain about. Growing up with that message, what do they pass on to their kids? We say that addiction is, is a genetic disease. It's passed on from generation to generation. While I agree with that, I also feel that the behaviors that family members entertain are also passed on from generation to generation. So I recommend <clears throat> that all participants on this call today um, start mapping out their genogram and really look for evidence of trauma, emotional response to it, what messages were passed on to you, what messages have you passed along from generation to generation to your kids, what message are your kids likely to pass on to theirs. Look at mental illness. What role does mental illness play in the family generational cycle? How about addiction? One reason why I like the tool so much is because it takes addiction off the responsibility of that single person and it shows that more globally that this is a family condition, that, uh, that you are not the only one within a hundred years of this family that has suffered with this. These have been some things that have worked throughout our time that uh, we can maybe incorporate now. These are some things that haven't worked. So would you characterize, so sorry to interrupt, but w so would you characterize the situation that the family's behaviors can either support and keep the addiction or in place in place or the family's behaviors can work to kind of confront and deal with the situation. I did an intervention two weeks ago on another family that is also um, a family owned law firm and what was striking when I did the genogram was that the mom has a brother who's essentially about to die any day now from cirrhosis of the liver. And he's in his 50s. Now that family's response to his addiction throughout the course of his life has really been one of hush-hush. That, you know, he's the one with the problem. He's the black sheep. Um, you know, we're not going to talk about it. He's going to do his own thing. And the result of having unaddressed addiction and lack of family involvement is that this guy is about to pass. Now, I'm not blaming the family, but their response to his disease throughout his life has been one of, you know, if, if we don't talk about it, it's not there. And unfortunately, that attitude has costed this guy his life. Now, on the other hand, this woman's son, who was the identified patient and the identified participant in the intervention, same name, 20 years younger, his parents did not want to make the same mistake. They do not want to keep this, the behavior of don't ask, don't tell, the behavior of if we just don't think about it, the problem won't exist. Let's just sweep this under the rug. That behavior ceased. And they talked to this kid, and it was, it was rough. 
You know, they were, you know, I've been working with this family for three months trying to, you know, support them and consult them. And there were times that they were close to pulling the trigger, like we have to confront them. But then they'd retreat to, oh, gosh, she went for a five-mile run today. How bad could it really be? So it took three months of this to really get them to, to commit. We had the family meeting a week ago Saturday. Uh, very powerful. You know, they talked about, they, they did not sweep anything under the rug. They talked about every impact that this young man's drinking and drugging had on the family, the family business, and the family relationships. We have a conference call tonight at 7.30. The guy has begun treatment, and the family has begun to uncover their effects of how his addiction has impacted them. So it's, it's the same family with two dramatically different responses. One of them has hope and will be able to have a life of recovery and will be able to continue the family uh, tree, while the other one, unfortunately, is, is going to pass any day. So that's one behavior of how families can impact and support addiction or impact and support recovery. And that's really just through honest communication and confrontation that this is not going to go away just because we don't address it. In fact, quite the contrary. Great, thank you. So uh, the other thing to elicit from the genogram are family strengths. Because to me, while addiction is a disease and is often uh, very costly, if not fatal, can be, you know, there's a lot of strengths within the family system. And, and, you know, one unique role of the social worker is that we're strengths-based, and we believe that the strength is inherent within the family. And I personally believe that I am not the expert on the family, that I may know something about addiction and recovery, but the family is the expert on the family. And so with the genogram, we can elicit strengths. You know, how have you overcome struggles in the past? You know, the unity, the coming together, the honesty, the resilience of the family. That's really what I'm trying to point out during the genogram because there's a lot of clues in that as to how to deal with uh, problems in the present. I recommend that to work with anybody. Uh, again, if you need further description or instructions, feel free to con contact me after the presentation. And just a note is that uh, we do genograms on a regular basis here at the center in a lot Excellent. of our programs, so uh, we can help families with that as well. Highly recommend it. I realize the difficulty of looking at your own family. It's easy to do another family's genogram. It's much harder to address my own. So uh, the good news is there is hope, and there are options for family members, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, let's take this opportunity again to break and ask any questions. Uh, there's on one question that, that the group uh, had asked, and that is, you know, what support systems are out there for folks who feel like there may be a family member uh, that is having an, a, prob a problem with addiction? Uh, what kind of support systems are there for the family member? And, who's not the addict. Yeah. You know, the first word of the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous is we admitted that we were powerless over alcohol. We. And while that's a very important message to share to the alcoholic that they are not alone, it's also a very important message to share to the family members. This is a very isolating disease. Oftentimes those that are inflicted feel that they are alone. Oftentimes the family members, too, feel that they are alone that they don't want to share to their neighborhood friends or their family friends because of the stigma associated. But there are resources. There are 12-step support groups within the community. Al-Anon is a group that was founded by the founder of AA's wife, historically for the wives of alcoholics who were largely men in their early 40s. But currently, as a membership of men, women, children, anybody that's uh, impacted by alcohol, Families Anonymous is also another group, 12-step group within many communities, FA. 
both programs utilize the same 12 steps as addict, uh, as Alcoholics Anonymous. Families Anonymous historically is parents and siblings versus spouses. Hazelden in Chicago would be an example of a, a local Chicago-based agency that is a strong resource for family members. They have a family program open to the community every Tuesday, 7 to 9 p.m. So you just pop in and uh, you never really know who shows up. Family members, patients, people from the community. It's a very good resource to learn about the disease of addiction and to find out local resources. Uh, tapping into any community agency that has substance abuse treatment uh, generally has a family program. So if there are people on this call outside of the Chicagoland area, uh, I think Hazelden is still a good overall resource, but you can just Google your local treatment center and see what they have in your community. Uh, I, as a social worker, am, am pretty well informed as well. So please, if, if I can help anybody find resources in their community, uh, or be a resource for you or your agency, I would be happy to direct you in any way that I can. But the important thing is we, and that there is help available. Great. Shifting gears to options. Most large companies have employee assistance programs. I know um, I'm entitled to one uh, through Hazelden. And I've used them at various junctures of my employment here. I've had a dad who's, who recently had a, uh, fell asleep behind the wheel and had a body temperature of 110 degrees. So he went into a coma for a little while and his, is currently in a nursing home. I'm not sure I'm going to be pulling him out. And uh, that impact is not unlike what my drug use did to him in the early 90s. Um, I am now seeing how a family member's illness can impact me, um, so I'm kind of on the reverse end of that. But I've reached out to my employee assistance program uh, just to support me through this, and, and I've been pleasantly surprised. I've never utilized it in the past. I have many referrals from EAPs in our community, um, but this was my first first-hand experience with it. And, and really, they provide you know uh, confidential support, usually uh, for a brief time period, uh, while you're going through something. Now, if it's a substance abuse issue, it will also be confidential. Um, generally, the EAP's role in substance abuse treatment is more of a referral than the actual assessment. The other option is confronting the employee. Going back to my client and the intervention in which the, the colleagues confronted him, you know, they pretty much gave them the hard sell that your office is closed until you get this issue addressed. When you get this issue addressed, we'll invite you back with flying colors. Intervention, this is where we, you know, uh, hire a trained professional to come in and kind of orchestrate, quarterback the entire process for you. Uh, I highly encourage that one. Um, not just because I'm a certified interventionist, but because I realize the, the gravity and the emotional difficulties of confronting those with addiction and, and to have a trained professional to walk you through that and to share the resources in the community, I think is a, a value. And often the human resources department as well. So again, although a supervisor may suspect that an employee's performance is poor because of underlying personal problems, it is up to the employee to decide whether or not that that is the case. Employee assistance programs deal with all kinds of problems, as mentioned. Some things to remember. Again, it's an employee's responsibility to decide whether or not to seek help. You know, ultimately we cannot force anybody to do anything. An employee's decision to seek help is a private one and will not be made public. It's very important, uh, just as the concerns and questions that have come up in this session, that confidentiality be respected at all times. It's also important to uh, remind you that addiction is treatable and reversible 
and that help is available. A lot of times there's a feeling of hopelessness. Some considerations to consider before, during and after treatment. Often, uh, again, when I see a patient that is in the, you know, beginning of the treatment process, there is often some type of negotiation uh, or contact that needs to be made on my end as a counselor with the EAP, human resources, or direct supervisor. Uh, it's important for the counselor to be on board with signed releases so that we can help the patient receive the time off that they're expecting to get, uh, but also to fill out any documentation that's needed from the EAP and or human resources. Um, another implication is the return to work. You know, a lot of people, um, you know, there's a lot of different models of treatment for addiction. Uh, the golden elixir of Substance abuse treatment is your typical 28-day inpatient, Hazelden, Minnesota, Betty Ford in California. These are 28-day facilities. Now, given the reality of our economic times, lack of insurance coverage, a lot of people don't want to take that time thinking that, well, you know, when they come back, they're not going to have a job. So the step down from that level of care is an intensive outpatient where they still live at home, they still are productive members of society, still working. However, they tap into at least nine hours of group therapy per week. We offer that here at Hazelden, Chicago. Uh, that's called intensive outpatient. Many people opt for that as a first line of defense, while historically that's been kind of an aftercare. But in any event, um, you know, this is not an acute illness. A person does not go through treatment and then get cured that there is a reintegration back into work that is going to take, that is a process in and of itself. So while the person is in treatment, whether it's inpatient or outpatient, it's important for the counselor to be in communication with employers to set boundaries, uh, back to work expectations, and to help facilitate the reintegration. It's not as simple as, all right, I'm out of treatment, I'm going to pop back in on Monday and nothing else needs to change except for me and I'm fine. Uh, it is an integration process, and I think the counselor comes in uh, to really link uh, and help communicate uh, the importance of the returning to work and both expectations from the addict alcoholic as well as from the employers. Finally, again, it's not an acute illness, um, so there is follow-up care. You know, it, it's important that once the, the client finished treatment, that they are linked with community resources to help them re-engage uh, with their families, uh, such as 12-step facilitation, individual therapy, family therapy, family coaching. A uh, very important piece of sustainable recovery is that program of action that a family and an individual puts together after treatment me, it's pretty easy to stay sober when you're in between four walls and you roll out of bed and there you are in rehab. It's a bit more difficult when you are performing life on life's terms, you're off that pink cloud and you start addressing a lot of this trauma and a lot of these issues that we talked about that were probably the precipitant of addiction to begin with. Again, just to um, talk a little bit more about EAP, uh, EAP can help employees decide what to do if they have a problem with alcohol or other drugs. I think that's probably the best first line of defense, if they're willing. And just to remind you that conversations with the EAP are confidential. Uh, at the end of the PowerPoint, I have some reading recommendations as well as some resources. This is my contact information. If I can be of any help to you, your family, or your agency, please don't hesitate to call or send me an email through my web page. At this time, I can answer any questions. 
Um, okay, we got uh, we have one question that is, um, what happens if somebody goes into treatment um, and they come out and the family hasn't made any changes? You know, that's often the case, unfortunately. And being an interventionist and a family therapist, um, you know, I have to say that, you know, this is a chronic disease that often ends in relapse. And, you know, we need to look at every resource available in the community to help with addiction recovery and sustainable recovery. It's impossible to think, in my opinion, that an addict is going to go through the treatment and recovery process, enter the same exact environment, and be able to fly, to be able to recover. Uh, so particularly in a family business, if family members have been impacted by the disease, it's imperative, in my opinion, unequivocally that they take a look at that and at minimal participate in any kind of family programming the treatment center may offer get to an Al-Anon meeting, read a book on addiction, read a book on codependency. I think that if a family member and a family does nothing, that the chances of the addict to really prosper in recovery um, become very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Not to say that it's impossible, but it, it's definitely more helpful when you have a family on board. Again, going back to that we, that this is a very isolated disease, and if a person comes back, and a family is unwilling to address any behavior, uh, it, it's going to feel very isolating for that individual. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important for family members to hop on board. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, thank you for your time, David, and thank you to everybody for their questions. Um, once again, if you uh, want to follow up and get any further information, if you want the slides with the uh, resources. We're happy to send those to you. Uh, and again, we hope everybody will join us for the program with Frank Abagnale from Catch Me If You Can uh, on September 20th next week. Um, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.